Pearly Aged Rap Lyrics is a series that I started two and a half years ago, and as some of you guys might know, it's a series that is retired for the time being. And as a big send-off, I guess, to the series, I decided to put the first seven parts together here as my first ever compilation video. It's one of my favorite series that I've made, so here they all are with the intros removed, so that each one just kind of runs into the next one with a very short transition slide in between each one. But hey, right before before we get started with that, today's video is sponsored by Atlas VPN. It was developed by top cybersecurity engineers and IT specialists, and it was created to make the internet safe and accessible for everyone. Keeping over 6 million users worldwide safe today. They have the best VPN deal on the market currently going, so if at any time you're interested, click the link at the top of the description for their summer deal of $1.83 per month, plus 3 months extra with a 30 day money back guarantee. Using Atlas VPN is great if you want to, for example, watch something on Netflix that's only available in a different country. It's super useful to use if you want to access another country's content library or even if you're traveling to a different country and you want to access your home country's content library. You could do that too with Atlas VPN. What's more, it prevents your Google searches from being tracked, it blocks all malicious ads, links, and trackers, and you can protect an unlimited number of devices with your single subscription. It's also great for saving money on stuff like online subscriptions, flights, and hotels where the pricing is usually location-based. So if this sounds like it would be useful to you, head to that link in the description below to take advantage of Atlas VPN's limited time summer deal. Like I said, it's $1.83 per month plus three months extra with a 30-day money-back guarantee. Much love to Atlas VPN for sponsoring today's video. So with all that being said, let's get started started with over one hour of poorly aged rap lyrics. Follow the trail. I made Sunday candy. I'm never going to hell. I met Kanye West. I'm never going to fail. He said, Let's you know, I really believed him when he said this. That verse on Ultralight Beam was so damn good. How could Chance fail after that? But Chance must have put a hex on himself with these lyrics because just a few years after he said these words, his failures would stack up like Tetris, mostly this year and last year. And it all really started with one album. Say it with me, everybody. The Big Day. Ooh, I love my wife. I love my wife. Some Chance fans would say that his decline started with Coloring Book. I personally think that's a phenomenal mixtape. I love it. But almost everyone is in agreement that The Big Day was a big disaster and the real downward turn for Chance's reputation. I think it was not good in the slightest, something that you can tell by my meme-filled review of the album that I uploaded last year, and the public ripped into it ferociously. The fan backlash really was immense, but that album didn't have to be the downfall of Chance's reputation there was still a chance for a comeback, if you'll pardon the pun. Or at least, there would have been. Until he started tweeting about how he felt like listeners wanted him to kill himself, when really they just thought your album was shit but don't want to see any real harm come to you as a person, started blocking his fans on Twitter, got ratioed by various hip-hop Twitter accounts, and then allegedly fired his manager due to the poor reception towards his terrible album and the poor ticket sales that resulted for the tour afterwards. Now that last part is just allegations, despite the fact that everyone's running with it as if it is facts, but in the case that it is true, how are you gonna fire your manager for that? Bro, you made the music. And now he's being sued for $3 million in allegedly unpaid commissions by his ex-manager. Like I said, Tetris. Shortly after he said that line on Ultralight Beam, public opinion completely turned against Chance. And only time will tell if he can correct that in the future. Yeah, I call it sweet and sour, and my lawyer say it's surgeon, I'm gonna call him in the house. Yeah, how are the flights? Yeah, considering the current state of things, you should probably call him faster than that, Chance. Am I being too petty now? I'm sorry, I'm sorry, I'm obsessed and white. Just rewind back a few seconds in the video when I was talking about Chance's current legal troubles to see why this line also aged poorly. Michael Jackson, <laughs> we was plotting, y'all was trying to get the packing. <laughs> Get the pack and you get raw for a fraction. Was trying to beat a case, but I ain't beat that case, bitch. 
I did the race. And with this line, TK would ensure that he did not beat the case. I promise, not all of these are related to legal troubles, but the first three in this series just happen to be. And those are the ones that typically age the worst, or the most ironically, anyway. The story behind this song is pretty well known. TK made it while on the run from the police as he was facing capital murder charges due to a robbery he was involved in that went south. Cutting off his ankle in a s- <laughs> Cutting off his ankle? There's no way he's gonna be doing the race like that. Cutting off his ankle monitor and escaping house arrest, something that he references very bluntly within the lyrics. Perhaps too bluntly, because these lyrics would end up going on to be used against TK as evidence in court, playing a part in landing him a 55 year sentence behind bars. Now, the whole topic of using rap lyrics in court to help get a sentence is a controversial topic, and it's one that I'm even not too sure about myself because TK is clearly referencing the crimes he was accused of on this song, but at the same time, so many rappers play up things in their music and play characters that it can be hard to tell when they're being serious about it and actually referencing something and when they're not, so it's a bit of a, a shaky ground. But either way, it's probably not the best idea to make a song clearly referencing the crimes you're accused of while on the run from the police where the overall message of the song is, I'm guilty, so I ran. Sure, it makes for a hell of a backstory to your song, but it also makes you look the furthest thing from innocent. Now I'm in the limelight cause I rock tight Time to get paid, blow up like the world trade Born sinner, the opposite <sighs> I don't think I have to go too into depth about what aged poorly on here. Now the song Juicy dropped in 1994 and what Biggie was referencing in his lyrics was a much smaller attack that took place in 1993 where a truck bomb was set off underneath the North Tower of the World Trade Center. Then in 2001, seven years after he said these lyrics, the September 11th attack on the Twin Towers happened. And understandably, this is a line that would then go on to be censored every single time it was played on the radio, or even when it was sampled into a new song, as can be heard on A Dream by Jay-Z. The attack Biggie reference still did kill six people and injured nearly 1,000, but I'm guessing this line was considered as more acceptable then because that wasn't a globally reported tragedy that shook an entire nation like the 2001 attack was that took the lives of nearly 3,000 people. So in between, you either loved it or hate it. Every CD critics gave it a three, then three years later they go back and re-rate it. And call the Slim Shady LP the greatest. The most I'm at this was a classic. The Eminem show was fantastic. Well, it's been 11 years since he said these words, and I can confirm that Encore is still dog shit. Now, I know Eminem is using hyperbole when he says that his album Encore will eventually be considered on par with what is considered to be one of the greatest rap albums ever made, Illmatic. Much in the same way that I used hyperbole when comparing Encore to actual dog shit. It at least has a couple more merits than that. But the message he's trying to send is that with more time, Encore will be considered an amazing piece of work after critics have had more time to digest it and realize its greatness. Because how could they not realize the greatness of this? And this? Is it gay to play put put golf with a friend yeah. and watch his butt butt when he tees off? Yeah. Butt, butt. And this? P P yes, I make R and B. I sing song and go ring it strong. Ching chong 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 ching. Closer to dog shit than Illmatic, if you ask me. It is fair to say that some of Eminem's work does get a bit more love in retrospect from critics but I can't see Encore ever becoming one of those albums. And I don't think Eminem can either, considering that he himself has discredited the album after this verse came out. If anything, Encore gets worse with time, and claiming that a couple of years will make it greater? That is how you make a poorly aged lyric. So 
so that was a fucking, fucking lie. lie. Boy, he looks like a trustable, solid young man. I really hope he doesn't go and snitch on his crew, therefore invalidating his lyrics about not saying anything when the police pull up on him. I'm pretty sure everyone watching this video is already very familiar with this whole 6 9 fiasco. This song was released in May 2018, and 6 9 testified in court that he started snitching on his associates the day after he was arrested in November 2018. According to this article from Vulture, during his testimony, he snitched on alleged Nine Tray members Nook, Harv, and Shotty, while also mentioning the rappers Trippy Red, Jim Jones, Cardi B, Casanova, and Chief Keef along with their alleged gang affiliations. As you can tell, the problem with these lines is that 6 9 did, in fact, know what happened. And that is knowledge that he made very clear to the people who wanted to know. If you want to hear more about this situation in depth, I'd highly recommend checking out Traplor Ross's series on 6 9 specifically the video about the trial itself. That's a video that I watched before scripting this segment, and you hear literally every detail that you need to hear. From that case. Regardless of whether you think 6 9 should have snitched or not, one thing that we can agree on is that it did make quite a few of his songs, including this one, sound like a complete facade in retrospect. The funny thing is, the whole reason why this line aged poorly is because of the very next line of this Rick Ross verse. You see, at the time this song dropped, Rick Ross had a sponsorship deal with Reebok, hence him shouting them out in his verse and saying that he would give his life over these easily replaceable 70 pound shoes. But that deal would not last very long as Rick Ross followed up his Reebok sponsorship shout out with the lines, I put Molly all in her champagne, she ain't even know it, I took her home and enjoyed that. She ain't even know it. Fucking yikes. He followed a brand endorsement with a date rape line. Now I've worked with a few brands before and I'm pretty sure the general error you get from the requirements they send you is not to mention rape alongside their products. The line of course is awful on its own, but surely he knew that there would be consequences with that. Safe to say, Reebok dropped him pretty quickly after this song's release. And you know what else in this situation aged like milk in the Sahara? Rick Ross's apologies for the line. They were all a little long, but here's some highlights that I've picked out from them to read to you guys. It was a misunderstanding with a lyric. Mm. A misinterpretation where the term rape wasn't used. I would never use the term rape. <sighs> Jesus Christ, Rick Ross. The term did not have to be used there. The line, I took her home and enjoyed that, she ain't even know it, explicitly implies it. In reality, some people do these things, and shouldn't it be brought to light so young women can protect themselves? If that was your intention, sir, then you brought it up in the worst way possible, because it sounds like you're bragging about sex with an unconscious, non-consenting woman. Someone on Ross's PR team must have realized that these apologies absolutely shit the bed, because just one day after he was dropped from his Reebok deal, Rick Ross, or more likely someone on his PR team, wrote and released an actual apology for the lyrics that acknowledged what was wrong with the line. <sighs> A messy situation indeed. Why he chose to say those lines in the first place, I will never know. I still express, yo, I don't smoke weed or sex. Cause it's known to give a brother brain damage. And brain damage on the mic don't manage nothing. Is this the real Dr. Dre that said this? The same Dr. Dre who dropped an album called The Chronic four years after the album that contained this line? The Dr. Dre who has a weed leaf on his 2001 album cover? This is the same man talking on this lyric about not smoking weed because it apparently gives you brain damage. Either Dre changed his opinions on the good old green stuff pretty drastically in four years, 
Or these lines were just a complete lie to make the song more radio friendly. The irony of that being that the song is all about being yourself and calls out other rappers for being different to how they portray themselves. Now, who knows, maybe Dre did just flip pretty quickly from non-weed smoker to massive spliff talker in four years. That is possible. But the line is just very funny to hear nowadays when we know that this is the same man that went on to have an album cover based off of Zigzag Rolling Papers and the CD for that album just had a massive marijuana leaf printed on it. And he went on to become one of the first people you think of when you think weed and hip hop. Now that we've talked about a few of these lyrics in depth, let's do a speed round before we get on to the last one on here. Are you guys ready? These are gonna fly by pretty fast. Three, two, one, let's go. Uh, my name is Corday, but don't forget the YBN. Corday has now left YBN. No more baby mamas. Shout out to my only baby mama. Lil Wayne now has four children with four different women. I could never have a kid then be out here still kidding around. Please refer to the story of Adidon at the one minute and 43 seconds mark. If I could predict my future. I bet 100 million. 100 million what, Vic? Else? I want a real love. Dark skin and ant viv love. That Jada in that weird love. Entanglement. Well, that does it for the speed round. So let's move on to our final pearly, 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 pearly aged lyric. Set a slit. Put a young law. Except Barry, he legit. Money. Man, ASAP Rocky really nailed the shitty person shout out roulette with this set of lines. In just four lines, he gave shout outs to three people who have pretty questionable reputations now. Let's go through them one by one. Case number one. Jabari ASAP Bari Shelton, the co-founder of ASAP Mob and the streetwear brand Velon. In January 2019, he pled guilty to one count of sexual assault against a woman in a London hotel room, with video evidence of him demanding sex from the woman and placing his hands on her body after she asked him to stop. It is worth mentioning, ASAP Rocky did later change these lyrics to ASAP Bari he a bitch when performing this song live and then was seen hanging out with Asa Bari within a week of doing that. So do with that information what you will. Case number two, Ian Connor, stylist, model, and ASAP mob associate. He has been accused of rape by multiple different women with 33 different allegations against him as of now. Now I know these are allegations, not convictions, but you have to question what the odds are of this many different women telling the same lie about one person. And it's not a good look that he took to Twitter to confidently mock and laugh at these allegations as they came out, which in my opinion is not something that any rational, sane, innocent person would do. Kind of reminds me of another incredibly short man in a similar situation right now. People have also said that once again, there is video evidence that exists of him inappropriately touching a woman after she told him no, but I personally couldn't find enough sources to confirm that. So if anyone watching this has more information on the validity of that video's existence, let me know. Ironically, one of the only people in Ian Connor circled to call him out on his rape allegations was ASAP Bari. And last but not least, case number three. Gosha Rubchinsky, a Russian fashion designer. In December 2018, he was accused of pressuring a 16-year-old boy into sending him explicit photos of himself, allegations which he has denied. His team claims that the requests are standard within the fashion industry to facilitate the casting of models and were taken out of context and modified to look malicious. And okay, maybe that's possible. Maybe Gosha didn't have any malicious intentions here and he was just concerned about finding the best model for the shoot. But even in that case, it calls into question the morals of the fashion industry, where it is procedure for grown men to ask boys aged 16 and below for topless photos of themselves, sometimes in their underwear, over social media directly. 
to cast them for a shoot. No one, no one sees how this procedure could be abused very easily. At the very least, Rocky's line here highlighted a lot of questionable people and standards that exist within the fashion industry. to my niggas when i'm in england call me eric von zipper uh -huh. sipping on dawn with prince andrew at the palace he digging my style with the chicks i show prowess when i'm in sipping on some of that fancy champagne in a palace with some english royalty sounds like a pretty standard brag rap nothing to see here wait a minute prince andrew the pedo prince? He's the one digging your style with the chicks? What age are the girls you're showing prowess with? Well, I should say allegedly. Prince Andrew is allegedly a pedophile. Much in the same way that this thing I'm holding in my hands is allegedly a microphone. If you've watched the infamous interview of this man bumbling through interview questions about his friendship with Jeffrey Epstein, among other things, you'll know that it's very hard to believe that this man is innocent of the things he's being accused of. Uh, another guest was John Brockman, uh, the literary agent. Now, he described really? seeing you there getting a foot massage from a young Russian woman. Did that happen? No. You're absolutely sure or yeah, you can't remember? absolutely sure. So John Brockman's statement is false? Well, I wouldn't, I wouldn't, I don't know Mr. Brockman, so I don't know what he's talking about. I don't know Mr. Brockman. This is John Brockman, uh, the literary agent. Now, he describes... Really? This line was wrapped in 2001, so at the time it probably seemed like nothing, but looking back at it now... Very unfortunate choice of royal from OC. <laughs> I really can't stop thinking about the fact that OC said Prince Andrew was digging his style with the chicks. Like, that's what he chose to talk about specifically. OC literally could have chose anyone else in the royal family as someone that he pulled girls with, and they probably still would have been a pedophile, but it would have been less publicly known. OC likely chose Andrew to shout out on this song about having loads of sex and drinking, because back then, Prince Andrew was known as the party prince. People just didn't know he was more of the party on a private island, so you can get up to something a lot more sinister type of prints. Please note that any objectively made statements in this segment were just for the sake of jokes and I am not throwing any true accusations Prince Andrew's way. It was just stated very objectively for the sake of comedy. I am saying this so that the royal family doesn't clap me. Speaking of predators, Tokyo's Revenge, ladies and gentlemen. Again, I'm gonna say allegedly, just to be safe here, there's no official charges that exist, but there is so many screenshots, and according to Tokyo's own fans, on his own subreddit, Tokyo himself admitted to sexually DMing and grooming at least one minor, who I believe was 14 years old at the time, while he was around 20 years old himself. While the lyric I've chosen doesn't directly relate to that, at least, Hopefully it doesn't. Hopefully he wasn't talking about minors in his lyrics this whole time. It's just kind of nasty hearing him talk about screenshots of a girl saying she would, and I quote, eat up on the cock, when we now know in reality the girls that he was DMing were not even old enough to drive. Now, this one is a bit of a risk to talk about because a YouTuber with a channel much bigger than mine, some of you guys will know who it is, but I'm not gonna name him here just in case he doesn't want his channel to be sort of brought into this situation again, but he actually had Tokyo DM him and say that his label would take legal action against him if he didn't remove the video that he made about Tokyo. Whether his label actually did say that or Tokyo just made it up to scare them into taking down the video, I don't know, but a light does need to be shone on this situation regardless of who's trying to cover it up. And that's not me blaming the person who took the video down, I'm just saying that's why I'm covering it in this video because I think it needs to be known. And it really makes you question, if he didn't do the things he was accused of, why would Tokyo, or allegedly his label, be threatening big YouTubers that talk about the situation? Why hasn't he himself addressed it properly without dancing around the questions? And why are even his biggest fans straight up saying that he's guilty? 
Just have a think about that. Pull it down and watch it slip off. Ever catch me cheating, she would try to cut my <laughs> crazy, but I love her. I feel like all of us knew that this him and I track by g Easy and Halsey was a bad idea from the second that it came out. Just based on what g Easy raps about in all his other songs, I heard this line and immediately thought to myself, hmm, this is gonna age very badly if he ends up cheating. And now it's on this list, so you can put two and two together and we can conclude that young Gerald is now dickless. <laughs> Let's um, take a moment of silence for g Easy's cock. Thank you for your respect. I don't think there has been an instance where Halsey has said in black and white terms that g Easy cheated, correct me if I'm wrong, but she has heavily implied it numerous times to the point that it's just obvious. And she confirmed that parts of her song Without Me, which at points references a cheating partner, was written about the guy who made a reference to the Damn Daniel meme within a song. Damn Daniel back again with the... Saint Laurent. Even if he didn't cheat, which I personally believe to be highly unlikely based on the evidence, we can just consider the whole him and I song as aging badly in general. Wait a minute, wait a minute. Do you guys, do you guys hear that? Do you hear that music creeping up in the background? You know what that means. It's time for another speed round. Let's go. Life is good. You know what I mean? Like, on the 10th of January 2020, Future proclaimed that life is good. And then in March of that year, the coronavirus outbreak was declared as a pandemic, and we've pretty much all been locked inside ever since. I guess that was just Mother Nature's spiteful way of hitting back at Future's misogyny. You're 40 and still rapping? Ugh. Dissing someone, in this case Jay-Z, when you're younger, purely for being older than you, isn't a very wise move, as it's always gonna backfire and be applicable to the rapper that said it, in the years down the lane. Pull up on your daughter like I'm Kevin fucking Spacey. Holy shit. Uh, my side bitch is A. Pull up on your daughter like I'm... This part of the song initially contained a reference to the movie American Beauty starring Kevin Spacey. This was long before we learned that Kevin Spacey was a nasty bitch. I attempted to replace the line with Lil Tracy, but for legal reasons I couldn't. So my message to you today is, fuck you, Kevin Spacey, you are a pussy. And I wish I could change the lyrics. It's too late now, baby. Enjoy the rest of the song. And if we ever played, I still beat you at a FIFA game. No, no. That. Yes, let's go. Just pass it to him. Yeah, brilliant, brilliant. Just fucking pass it to him. What, bro? What is that? Oh, BS, yes, bro. Oh, fuck this game. Oh, shit. Nah, nah, I'm out, bro. I'm taking oh, my you are. You're taking it. Uh, of course you are. You, you took a W in the shit game. KSI did not beat Quaderka a FIFA game. And that does it for this edition of the Poorly Aged Rap Lyric Speed Round. So let's move on to our final in-depth selection before we close out this video. We about to do. Well, I don't care about the money, like it's the respect that I'm wanting. Honestly, I just want to be one of the greats where they got to bring a boy up every debate. I, I really used to be in Lil Dicky's corner, man. This was Dicky's response on the song Professional Rapper when Snoop Dogg asked him where he saw himself in five years in the rap game. I believed him when he said this, and while I can't see what he's doing behind the scenes now, it's very hard to believe that his current goal at this moment is still to receive serious respect as a rapper, as he claimed on this song. That was one of the main messages of the professional rapper track, to show that he cared about the genre, to show what he was all about, and show that he cared about being a staple within the genre. But now it seems like he just pops up to drop viral pop rap songs once a year or less, with his last full rap album releasing in 2015. And it is sad, because I did like his music when it was coming out. I thought Professional Rapper was a really entertaining album, and I was honestly quite impressed by quite a bit of Dickie's rapping throughout it. And quite a few of the songs were just really catchy. Now it just feels like his heart isn't really in rapping anymore, and he just wants to pursue success through other avenues, like his TV show, Dave, which of course isn't a bad thing. If that's what he wants to do with his career, then absolutely he should go down the avenue that he wants to. But it just makes it a lot harder to listen to songs like this 
and believe that he truly means what he's saying from the heart. If you look at his Wikipedia page, the first paragraph under his career section says, Dicky initiated his rap career simply to get attention comedically, so he could write movies, write TV shows, and act. However, he fell in love with rapping and says he's not leaving that game until he's proved his point. From that quote, he made it clear that he wanted to write and star in TV shows from the start. That was the initial goal and rap was just the springboard for that. Even if he did eventually fall in love with it like he said and wanted to prove a point, it seems like that isn't the case anymore and that his aspirations have shifted back to what they were before rap was a part of his life. No longer does he want to be one of the hip hop greats. Like I talk to Shai, see when I shot niggas And Monte keep it on him, he done drop niggas Jaja told me flip them packs and how to maintain I'm with Trigger, I'm with Rasha, I'm with Agro Bitch, call the body, about a week ago, a week ago because nothing ages worse than a song that basically snitches on you and your entire crew. Bobby Shmurda name dropped around 10 of his GS9 associates in one verse here, with the most notable ones being Bobby himself, Monty, Jaja, Rasha, A-Rod and Mitch. Why these guys in particular? Well, Bobby was charged with conspiracy to murder, weapons possession and reckless endangerment in 2014, and served 6 years before being released 10 months early. Also, as a quick side note, I'm pretty sure the genius annotation for the first line of this song isn't correct. I'm almost certain that Bobby is saying, and Chewy, I'm some hot neighbor, because Chewy is Bobby's nickname, and in the music video, Trigger, that's Trigger, points to Bobby when he says this first line of the song. Monty, referenced in this lyric, was sentenced to seven years in prison for a conspiracy to commit murder and weapon possession. Jaja, Bobby's brother, was charged with conspiracy and weapon possession, with one of the conspiracy charges being third degree sale of a controlled substance. Rasha and A-Rod, Let's talk about them together because those are the biggest charges here. Rasha was sentenced to 98 years for conspiracy, murder, attempted murder, and assault, and A-Rod was sentenced to 53 and one third years for pretty similar charges. Additionally, according to the 63 page long indictment about the GS9 case, Rasha accidentally shot A-Rod in the arm when trying to hit a rival gang member. I just thought I'd bring that up because they're mentioned in the same lyric together. And then finally, Mitch, the member referenced in the most popular line in the song. He was never charged with actually catching a body, which would have made that line age even worse, but he served five years for attempted murder and assault. It was a really kind gesture of Bobby to put together this little guide to his gang and what crimes they might be guilty of for the police. And if you want a bonus line from this song, GS9 I go so hard, but GS for my gun squad, because Look at those firearm charges on his crew. I think it's safe to say a large majority of the lines on this song aged in a pretty interesting way. Yeah, yeah, who the fuck I rep? Can you remind me? It's fun for you till I D.I.E. my nigga. Hobson is still alive, which is good, but funk volume is not. So naturally, this is a lyric that has progressed in an unbecoming way as time has moved forward. This is part four guys, I'm trying to find more creative ways of saying the phrase, this line didn't age well. For anyone watching who isn't familiar with Hobson's career, aka Virgins, how could you not be familiar with Hobson's career? Funk Volume was a label that he started in around 2008 with Damien Ritter, aka Dame, remember that name, it's gonna be relevant later, who was the brother of Swizz, the first artist signed to Funk Volume and a close collaborator and friend of Hobson. The label went on to get some underground buzz and grew over time with the addition of some new rappers and producers, namely Dizzy Wright, Jaron Benton, DJ Hopper, and Kato. They dropped a documentary focusing on the label, they dropped songs as a collective every year for about two years to showcase the existing roster and any new members that had been added to the label. And from the outside, it looked like things were going pretty well. But as detailed by Hobson, an ill mind of Hobson 8, him and Dame did not get along as business partners. We gave you our trust, then you had us cornered. You got us a shitty label deal with Warner. And if I confront you about it, you tell me I need counseling and I got a disorder. And long story short, the label would go on to collapse, 
break apart, and it was not FV till Hobson DIEs, my neighbor. As for where everyone involved is now, Swizz is still dropping music every month, Dizzy Wright and Jerem Benton are still dropping music frequently, and Hobson and Dame have actually made up with each other now. So at least this one had a happy ending. Oh fuck, I just reminded myself of the song. Oh my god, get it out, get it out. Damon Hop actually made a four-part podcast together where there's just a bunch of information about how the label started, how the issues between them formed, and how they eventually made up with each other years later, so I would definitely recommend checking that out. Avian of the winter when the jet stream is how it happens, 2020 combined with coronavirus, body stacking. Out of all the lyrics that I've covered in this series, this is probably the one that I wish didn't age as bad as it did the most. Or maybe it technically aged well because what it talked about really happened. I don't know, but either way, it's not a fun situation. This song, Pandemic, was released in 2013, and with lyrics like this, you're probably thinking, fucking hell, we've got a new age Nostradamus on our hands. And it does look at least slightly creepy. Until you read the really long explanation that Dr. Creep posted on Facebook about this song. Because of course, a rapper that raps a lot about conspiracies uses Facebook. I'm gonna heavily cut it down to the relevant parts, but in the post, he said, There was already six or so coronaviruses in 2012 slash 2013 when the song was made. As for mentioned in 2020, well, 2020 to 2030 was just significant years to me. As well as many other esoteric people who are educated on these topics. To me, the lyrics are just more of a coincidence than a prediction. So no, the line here isn't a warning or a prophecy or an indication that the pandemic was planned and Dr. Creep had that insider government knowledge, but it's just extremely unfortunate that what he rapped about in this song did go on to become reality. Anyway, Rona isn't too fun to talk about for too long, so let's perk things up a bit with another speed round. Let's go. 2020, I'ma run the whole election. Kanye West got 60,000 votes out of about 160 million in the 2020 I election. Never win. This me, you'll never hear a reply for it. This is the second time I've done a speed round where a Drake lyric has aged badly because of Pusha T. Don't let him censor your thoughts. Don't let him make you regret that you talk. Don't let him tell you that nice is the lie, trying to make you all writer when nothing is wrong. Watch the first 10 minutes of my one hour long video reviewing Tom McDonald's Gravestones album, and you'll see why these are some of the most hypocritical lines he's ever rapped. Yes, I did include this lyric just to plug that video. Please guys, watch it. Make my suffering worth it. And don't worry about that detox album. It's coming. We gonna make Drake do it. <laughs> this song came out in 2004. Detox is still nowhere to be seen, but maybe I'm just underestimating how long it takes to make Dr. Dre do something. This is death for auto tune, moment of silence. This one dropped in 2009, and I can't physically count the number of songs that have dropped since then that have heavily used autotune and got a big hit with it. So, now that the speed round is done, let's move on to talk about the final lyric that I chose for this video. My mouth is full of saliva, my night is out, and I'm ducking on the side of your house. See, it's sad it came to this point, such a disappointment. I had to make this appointment to come and see you. Sneak all the way round to the back porch, man, door handles unlocked. Shouldn't be that easy to do this, you don't plan for intruders beforehand. Eminem killed by Eminem, Matthew Mitchell. This song was an absolute highlight from Eminem's 2013 album MMLP2 and serves as the sequel to his legendary song Stan, where Stan's brother Matthew Mitchell breaks into Eminem's house and kidnaps him with the intent to murder him because Matthew believes that Eminem is responsible for Stan taking his own life. Now, for this lyric to age badly, something similar must have happened in real life, and that sounds pretty crazy, but but it did. And there's one coincidence in particular here that is wild. In April of 2020, Eminem woke up to an intruder standing behind him, which already just by itself sounds terrifying. Then Eminem asked him why he was there and the intruder allegedly said that he was there to kill him after he'd been lurking outside of his house for a while. You can see the similarities in this situation to the aforementioned lyrics coming through already, but here's the crazy one that I mentioned earlier. The intruder that broke into Eminem's house with the alleged intent to kill him, was called Matthew, just like Matthew Mitchell from the song Bad Guy. And it's not even the first time that he tried to do this, as in June of 2019, he was arrested for trespassing on another home that used to belong to Eminem. It's just a crazy situation, and it's extremely fortunate that nothing even more serious occurred when this guy broke into his house. Lil Uzi 
took a risk here by essentially placing a bet on a fairly unpredictable sport in the lyrics of his song. Further than that, it's in the title of the song itself. Uzi, you could have just waited. The story behind it is in 2015, Ronda Rousey, one of the most famous UFC fighters in the world, one of the most well-known ones at least, was undefeated going into her match with Holly Holm with a record of 12 to 0 wins to losses. And after that match, her record was 12 to 1. <laughs> She was knocked down, like the first half of Uzi's line suggests, but with the second half, he showed his faith in Ronda, believing that she can get back up, return like she never lost, and beat her next opponent, Amanda Nunes. But this lyric is in this video, so I'm sure you already figured out that Nunes beat Ronda Rousey in 48 seconds, left her face looking like a rare steak, her official record was now 12-2, and, and Ronda unofficially retired from the UFC afterwards, and is now signed as a professional wrestler in the WWE. Okay, maybe you didn't figure out all those specific details, but she lost. Uh, that, that's what I'm sure you figured out. Uzi released this song in July of 2016, so with the Rousey Nunes fight happening in December of 2016, this song went out of date in about five months. Let's just pretend that Uzi was talking about the WWE with this song. That would make sense now, considering Ronda Rousey just came back following a loss three years ago to win the Royal Rumble this year. So it works if you just pretend it was about that. Walk inside a death jam. Step on the president table and dap him up with the left hand Cause I'm counting money with the right in 2016, Logic spoke on this track about being friendly with the top guys at Def Jam and about all the big bands that he was making with them. It's definitely real money, guys. N nothing sus going on here. But this turned around just four years later in 2020 when Logic revealed on Instagram that the people that he had worked with weren't getting paid, which was the label's responsibility. A situation which definitely didn't earn the label any daps from Logic. In the post, he shared screenshots of texts that he received from Kevin Randolph, who is known for voicing the character of Kai, mainly on Logic's album The Incredible True Story, and has also produced some tracks of his, which I actually didn't know. I didn't know that was the same person until I researched this segment. I don't know if that's just me though. With Kevin clearly being confused that he hadn't received any payment whatsoever for the work that he did on Logic's albums. Logic explained in the post that he didn't really want to start any trouble with the label, but it was starting to affect his personal relationships, and if it was an issue that went on for that long, then I think it's perfectly fair that he made it public. Among the others that hadn't been paid, Logic also named his DJ Rhetoric, Six, his main producer and a cornerstone of his albums, and Lil Wayne, who wasn't paid for his verse on the remix to Logic's song Perfect, which stopped it from coming out. He also stated in that post that aside from his advance, he had not seen a single cent in the eight years that he had worked for Def Jam. It's worth noting though that some of these issues might be resolved now, probably because of that post by Logic, because the perfect remix with Lil Wayne did end up coming out in September of 2021. Which presumably means that Def Jam finally paid out to him and hopefully to everyone else involved in this situation as well. Back ain't nothing but a young thug. HK, AKs, I need to join a gun club. They know I got that broccoli. Okay, to quickly sum up why this one is on here, Jeezy was arrested in 2014 after his tour bus was raided by the police and they found an AK-47 and a Glock two of the specific guns that were mentioned in this lyric years before. But that's not really the interesting part or what the focus should be here, because this was kind of a bullshit arrest from the start. You see, Jeezy co-headlined an event with Wiz Khalifa and there was a murder via shooting at the concert. Tour bus was raided, the straps were found, and Jeezy along with the five other people on the bus were arrested. But this is where things get a bit sussy, because it was reported that early on, authorities knew that one, the guns didn't belong to Jeezy or anyone else on the bus and in fact belonged to his security chief who wasn't on the bus at the time and had purchased the guns legally. I should add that when it comes to the AK-47 he purchased it legally in Georgia but it was illegal in California which is where the tour bus was raided but regardless of that the security chief never had charges pressed against them so clearly that wasn't really the issue here. Two, no one on the bus was near the weapon when the police entered it as it was stored in a case behind 
behind the security chief's bed. Three, DNA testing confirmed that no one on the bus even touched the weapons. And four, authorities knew that the guns that they found weren't involved in the murder at the concert after inspecting them. So then you do have to wonder why all six of them were arrested, why they had their money, clothes, jewelry, and other personal items confiscated, despite those things having nothing to do with the charges or the case, and were all held on one million dollars bail each, when the recommended bail for a charge like this is twenty thousand dollars, with everyone spending four days in jail before the bail was reduced. The charges, of course, went on to be dropped, but the whole thing was just suspicious from the police side of things. Jeezy was quoted after all of this as saying, I pray this had nothing to do with race, but it definitely had nothing to do with evidence. The BRK that Chris Travis references here stands for Blackland Raider Clan, commonly just referred to as Raider Clan, and it was a group started in 2008 and led by Space Ghost Perk. You may or may not be aware of them, but they had a pretty big influence over hip hop, specifically when we're talking about that sort of SoundCloud rap style that became really popular in 2017. With the prevalence of distortion, making music with whatever equipment you had, even if it was low quality, and lo-fi sound. And they were doing it before anyone else really was, like they were active as a group between 2008 and 2015, before the SoundCloud scene even really took off like that. It contained other members you might be aware of, like Xavier Wolf, Young Simi, and of course, Denzel Curry. However, when it comes to this lyric aging poorly, they fell off pretty rapidly after this track with the group not dropping any type of album together since 2015, core members leaving the group, and Space Ghost Perp being more known now for beefing with a lot of people, including members of the Raider Clan which just aided in its dissolution, and dropping some of the wildest tweets that you have ever seen in your life. Shout out to ETHG Stay Based for making me aware of this one. Ladies and gentlemen, do you hear that sound? Do you know what that means? It's the speed round. Multiplied and we did that years ago and I still keep doing it. The irony of Gerald Easy saying this on the album with his lowest first week sales yet, that is yet to go gold and has zero platinum singles so far on it, is not lost on me. About to have everybody saying who is Ricky Wayne. These are confident words coming from a man whose rap name will forever be confused with a T-Pain Lil Wayne collaboration album. This is celebration with no invitation. This the last one that I'm done. Permanent vacation. This would have been a great way for Logic to close out his career, but that permanent vacation officially came to an end after less than a year of retirement. The super dope manager, Jerry Heller. Dr. Dre would go on to quickly fall out with Jerry Heller and said that he was the reason that his group NWA broke up due to his management. Not super dope after all. So that does it for the quick speed round on this video. Now let's get into talking about the last lyric on this list, which is a little bit different and um, is definitely a more serious one. I said go and get the thing. Cause you're gonna end up dead. You won't be laying on that bed. Because I'm coming for your head. Like I said, this one is different to any other lyric that I've covered in this series because I cannot find this song. But due to various news outlets, I do know that it existed. And a shout out to Jacob Watts for making me aware of this one in my comments. There's two people we're gonna be referring to for this one. Shane Villalpando and his close friend Anthony Morello, aka Lil A, two guys from California. The first one, Shane Villalpando, was accused of raping a 16 year old girl, Delaney Henderson, when he was 17 years old, and an unnamed 14 year old girl when he was 18 years old. The case with the 14 year old girl eventually went to trial and long story short, he was convicted of three counts of unlawful sex with a minor. And because of this, he was sentenced to one year in county jail, and had to register as a sex offender for five years. Now this case took place, or the sentencing took place in like 2013, so that registration has already expired by now, which seems pretty fucking light for a crime that can completely alter the course of someone else's life. So 
Where does Anthony Morello come into this? Well, after his friend was once again found guilty of unlawful sex with a 14 year old, he made the song that this segment focuses on, dissing her and Delaney who accused Shane of rape, calling out these at the time minors by their full names and saying he was gonna kill them. This then resulted in Anthony Morello getting his own court case as he was accused of threatening the girls with the song. That's the only way that I was able to find out the lyrics to this track because of that that court case and the reports about it. However, after three years, Anthony was found not guilty on freedom of speech grounds and the reasoning was because it was a rap song posted online in sort of like a fictional performance and not a direct threat made to the survivors. But he is found guilty in my own personal court of being a heartless prick. This case was pretty heartbreaking to look into from the fact that both of the survivors had to move schools because by all accounts the sex offender Shane was the popular kid so they got bullied and harassed for accusing him. And this Anthony dickhead to my knowledge has shown zero remorse for defending his convicted sexual offender friend. I can only hope that both of the survivors are doing well now and I actually know that Delaney Henderson, the one that was 16 years old at the time, is actually now an ambassador for PAVE, promoting awareness, victim empowerment, and travels the United States to publicly speak on sexual assault prevention and the bullying that often occurs after incidents like this. Saying in a 48 hour segment with CBS that whatever I do in my life, I want to help people. I was put in this situation for a reason and I came out of it for a reason. I decided to close out with that one because while we do have a lot of fun in these videos, this one is a serious and important one. Don't be like either of these guys and don't bully or harass people who come out with stories like this. It sounds incredibly obvious. It sounds like panderingly obvious, but stories like this prove that to some people it's still not. If anything sticks with you from this video, I want it to be that. As I've said before, I don't think a lyric can age worse than when it's literally being used against a rapper to try and convict them. I'm assuming almost everyone who watches my channel is familiar with the Young Thug case at the moment, but if you're not, Here's a quick rundown. Young Thug was arrested in May of this year, being charged in a 56 count RICO indictment. For anyone not familiar with the RICO Act, to put it bluntly, it is some pretty serious shit. RICO is a federal law that was created in 1970 to combat organized crime, and at the time was used to prosecute the mob, because basically RICO allows for an entire criminal organization to be prosecuted, rather than individual members of that organization being being prosecuted in individual cases, with serious sentences for the people involved. So in this case, the YSL crew headed by Young Thug is being slapped with charges as a whole as a criminal organization affiliated with the Bloods gang. If you look at the indictment document, Thug specifically is being charged with conspiracy to violate the RICO Act and participation in criminal street gang activity. Other recognizable names in the 56 count indictment are Gunna, Yak Gotti, Duke, and Unfunk, I believe is how you say that one. This, as I'm sure you might have guessed, is where the lyrics come in. For nine years, prosecutors have been monitoring music and social media posts from members of YSL to gather evidence of the group being a criminal organization. Looking through the 88 page document is pretty insane. For example, they have this 2014 Instagram post from Young Thug with the comment, defendant Jeffrey Williams, Young Thug's real name, an associate of YSL, did pose for a photo released on social media wearing red clothing and flashing a YSL gang hand saying, an overt act in furtherance of the conspiracy. The lyric I included before this segment is also being used as evidence of gang participation, but some of the other ones in there are wild. Never did I think I would see a court document that states, defendant Jeffrey Williams, an associate of YSL, appeared in a video released on social media titled, Ooh, where defendant states, Red just like Elmo, but I never fucking giggle. 
an overt act in furtherance of the conspiracy. Now, when there's a RICO case, as far as I'm aware, it's a fairly good indication that this isn't something to be taken lightly, but the use of rap lyrics as evidence in legal cases is always sketchy to me. Rap lyrics aren't exactly concrete, they're often exaggerated or completely fabricated and not references to reality at all. Sometimes they absolutely can be references to reality, but how do you make that distinction? Surely there could also be confirmation bias that goes into that, like if you're a prosecutor, you want these lyrics to be referencing specific crimes, therefore they must be. And then what if you have a jury that has a certain bias against rap music? and considers it to be a violent genre, it just doesn't seem concrete. Again, there's probably some evidence outside of lyrics that the prosecutors have against Young Thug, but the lyrics being included in this legal case at all isn't a great precedent to set. Only time will tell how all of this is going to end up. Yang. They don't know about them lights on the block, all tempos up, used to fight for the block. And no big crack to see for his block, HSM 79, they run us the gangway, slot through when we slam it, don't care about no cameras, you bitch niggas know how my gang play. While it's a topic of discussion, we might as well just keep the Rico case stories going. And after G. Fredo and his crew got hit with the Rico charge, I guess the feds did know about their nights on the block. Shout out to Mickey D for bringing this case to my attention and for giving me that free joke to use. At the time that this case happened in 2020, it was labelled as the largest crew takedown in rap history, with 31 suspected members being charged in the federal indictment as part of the Boston-based NOB gang. In particular, G. Fredo himself was charged with RICO conspiracy, conspiracy to distribute controlled substances, and possession with intent to distribute controlled substances. And as as this one was a case where the charges were brought forward a couple years back, we actually have a clearer picture of how this one is going to be ending up, compared to the YSL case which is at an earlier stage of the process. In June of this year, G. Fredo pled guilty to all three of his charges, along with nine other NOB members pleading guilty to RICO charges, with sentencing scheduled to take place in September and November of this year. In this particular case, I couldn't actually find if lyrics were used as evidence of gang activity, but I wouldn't be surprised if they were, and it's impossible to hear these lyrics now and not think of the Rico conviction of G. Fredo. Back in Toyota like I'm in the league. And it ain't no mosh pit if ain't no injuries. This one is a heavy one to include, but I think it's the definition of a lyric that aged horribly. Because as we all know by now, there was a lot more than injuries at Travis Scott's 2021 Astroworld Festival. Every single time you hear this lyric on this song now, it just sticks out like a sore thumb. In total, 25 people were hospitalized due to injuries that they suffered at the event, and 10 people passed away due to asphyxia from the crowd crush. It was an absolutely tragic event and I'd be interested to see if when Travis Scott is performing live again when he does this song, if he's still gonna say this line regardless of what happened. The next day. It's hard to say who was truly responsible for the tragedy at this event, as I believe investigations are still underway. But everyone from Travis Scott, to the promoters Live Nation, to the security contractor for the show, to the managers of the venue itself, could be considered as legally liable for the deaths, depending on where the investigations go. Andy Kush, or Andy Kush, wrote a great article for Pitchfork breaking down how any of these people or groups of people could be considered as liable for what happened. So I'll leave that link down in the description below so you guys can go and give it a read. One thing it makes clear is that it's definitely more complicated than saying one person or one group of people is responsible for what happened. I think it was failures from multiple different aspects that caused an event like this. But again, we just have to wait and see how it plays out. So that is our first three poorly aged rap lyrics for this video. But before we get into the fourth and final one, you know what time it is. It's speed round time. Zero for three now, Gerald. Ye and Kim, no more. Tyga and Kylie, goodbye, thankfully. Young Gerald and Kendall, never happened as far as we know. Every part of this lyric aged poorly. Soon I'll be the king like Prince Charles, Charles. Tiny 
Tempa clearly underestimated how long Royals can live for because he said this line 13 years ago and still the Queen and Prince Charles would need to pay God a visit for Charles's child to become king. My man has been second in line for 40 years. Soon was not the right word to use here. Better watch out for Rico. As we established earlier, Gunna was also named in the 56 count YSL indictment. Watch out for Rico indeed. Please believe me, I see Riri, I'ma eat it like Panini. Yeah, I don't think Rocky would appreciate you doing that now, my man. So that's the end of our quick little speed round today. And with that being over, let's get into the fourth and final lyric for today. The only way I leave, I love to watch them squirm. I love when bitches bleed. If she's sucking on the barrel, you can't hear a scream. Uh, this episode has just been a real bundle of laughs, hasn't it? Now, I'm someone who only got super into the music of Brockhampton in the past couple of years or so, but even then, I was still somewhat familiar with the Amir Van situation before then. If you happen to not be familiar with the situation, Amir used to be a member of Brockhampton, but he isn't anymore, and as this series always goes, it has something to do or relates in some way to these lyrics right here. To get right into it, in May of 2018, Amir was accused of sexual misconduct and abuse, with specific allegations of being emotionally manipulative and mentally abusive, and then after that, accusations of sex with a minor. Amir responded to these claims, saying himself that, I've been in relationships where I've fucked up and disrespected my partners. I've cheated and been dismissive to my exes. In response to the claims of emotional and sexual abuse, although my behaviour has been selfish, childish and unkind, I have never criminally harmed anyone or disrespected their boundaries. I have never had relations with a minor or violated anyone's consent. Unfortunately, with it being difficult to prove that all these things did happen, plus it being difficult for Amir to prove that all these things didn't happen, to people that aren't, you know, involved in the situation such as myself or all the fans that were just kind of looking in on this situation, it's completely a he said, she said type of deal. Where I think it's impossible to make any definitive statements of guilt or innocence. This of course put everyone in the group in a tough situation as this was not only a member and a close friend of theirs, but this was also the face of the Saturation Trilogy, with him being the sole person on the cover for every single one. Their upcoming album at the time, Puppy, was shelved and then cancelled, Amir was kicked out of the group, and ever since then they've been making music of their own. It is hard to say what Amir definitely did or definitely didn't do, but what you can say is that you certainly notice these lyrics every time you hear them now. This line was garbage from the very start, I'm not going to dispute that, but considering that it was said before Tory Lanez was found guilty of shooting Megan the Stallion, it's even worse now that the verdict is out. Now of course, it was the shocker of the century when the man who clearly exhibited the behaviour of the toxic manipulative guilty party after being accused turned out to be the toxic manipulative guilty party. Party. But why would Drake even take the risk of mocking the victim of an assault with a line like this? By saying this, he invited more hate towards Megan, who we know for a fact now was the victim. Of course, when the backlash to this line occurred, you had 300 IQ comments from rappers like Lil Yachty pretending to not know what a double entendre is, despite being a rapper himself. But this is very clearly a reference to Megan being shot, insinuating that she was lying about it, while also being wordplay to say that Drake was talking to a woman who lied about getting ass shots but is still thick. People love to play dumb about this specific line for some reason. Just really gross, and I can only assume it's Drake throwing a diss line at another female rapper who wouldn't give him the time of day because he's an insecure little bitch boy. Uh, stepped out of bail, I did a diddy bop. I had to tilt my hat at the city cop. I walk away free cause I'm innocent. Okay, this one is gonna be very quick as a sort of bonus to the last segment, but the irony of Tory Lane saying I walk away free because I'm innocent should be clear as day now. This Daystar album really had Tory fans convinced that he was innocent just because he said so over a beat. <laughs> Kendall Kelly, yeah, 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 yeah
This song honestly holds a special place in my heart now because it really grew on me while I was doing one of my album reset streams to Die Lit, and one of my viewers, Awesome Antoine, literally reset the songs with his donations until I enjoyed it. And, and I did, it grew on me. And it also helped me notice this line, which has aged pretty badly now, considering that Adidas have, at least temporarily, dropped Kanye West from their deal after some anti-Semitic remarks that he made in 2022. Making Kanye fall from billionaire status to multi-millionaire status. While we're on that specific subject, actually, and as it's the last episode for now, here's a bonus poorly aged rap lyric. I could give a dollar to every person on earth. What's it aged even worse than these lines though is the Kanye quote where he said, I can say anti-Semitic shit and Adidas cannot drop me. I don't even need to add anything else to that. The comedy speaks for itself. To one take quote, up, blow up and be in a position to meet Run DMC and induct him into the motherfucking rocking. Well, Hall of Fame, only Hall of Fame I'll be inducted in is the Alcohol of Fame on the wall of shame. Eminem is no stranger to having self deprecating lines within his rap lyrics, and this one from Rap God, which really was one of the turning points for modern day lyrical spiritual miracle rapping, had this line about him never being inducted into any type of musical Hall of Fame like Run DMC, who he himself inducted in 2009. However, this line would end up aging pretty ironically almost a decade later, when in 2022, Eminem was inducted into the very same Rock and Roll Hall of Fame by Dr. Dre. It's always nice when there's a happy ending to a poorly aged rap lyric, or maybe that kind of makes it fall more under the category of poorly aged rap lyrics. Maybe. Sometimes there's lines that fall kind of between the two. And I just reminded myself of that live stream where I listened to Happy Ending by Hobson for eight hours on repeat. Not only do I do album reset streams, I do song reset streams. You should check them out when I do them, they're pretty fun. Now I could mention the fact that Lil Pump's album sales have declined sharply since he said this in 2017, with his most recent album Lil Pump 2 not even charting on the Billboard 200, or that he hasn't had a Billboard charting song since 2019. But music sales aren't necessarily a reliable indicator of wealth, rappers have other ways to generate money. What definitely does doesn't help Lil Pump get richer though is millions of dollars worth of tax debt. As reported by All Hip Hop just a few weeks ago, Lil Pump has only paid $90,000 towards his $2 million tax debt from the past four tax cycles, leaving him owing the IRS $1.9 million currently. Not only that, but then they reported the day after that that Lil Pump was also in trouble with City National Bank, who extended him a $300,000 line of credit pre-pandemic. As of now, with interest, he still allegedly owes them over $100,000. <sighs> if there is one thing that certainly does not make anyone richer, it's debt. On a serious note though, hopefully some maybe poor decisions that he made with money when he was younger don't affect him too badly now because overall it does seem like he's been in a better place recently. Like if you see him in interviews, he looks pretty healthy, he's talking really clearly, and he just sounds really sound of mind. So I hope he manages to get it sorted out and he has good advice from people who can help him through that. Disney Channel flow, Bob, been on YouTube in six months, never done before, Pass all the competition, man, PewDiePie is next. Wait, why the fuck did I even put this on here? This is why this needs to be the final part. Uh, Jake Paul did not surpass PewDiePie in terms of subscribers after saying this. On to the next one. I don't even like this beat. But fuck it. I'm on this bit like a few bucks and I don't like this beat. Now either Lil Wayne was just exaggerating about how much he dislikes this beat here, or he just forgot about it because years later on the Carter 5 in 2018, he would use a reworked version of this instrumental for his song Uproar, resulting in an extremely similar sounding beat to Green Ranger. I got my drawers on, Sam Rothstein, 44 on my waist, Rick Ross jeans, wow, get the fuck though, I don't bluff bro, aiming at your head. Like a buffalo. And in my opinion, he sounded great over it both times. Honestly, Wayne saying he didn't even like the beat became ironic the second that he had a brilliant verse on Green Ranger. Uproar just adds to it. Bet they wanna see me dead. Tom McDonald has left his room since releasing this song in 2019. 
He's fine. Now hey, there's nothing wrong with wanting to work with one of your inspirations and a legend in the hip hop industry, but calling out said rapper publicly on a song can age a little bit funny when time passes and there's crickets from the other end. And the lyric really stands out because it's the closing lines on the song. I know at the very least, Logic and Jay-Z have had a couple interactions in real life and who knows, maybe they've even had dinner together. But in terms of music, since Logic said this in 2018, Jay-Z has not given him one of his coveted feature verses for this song or any others for that matter. But hey, unless Logic and Jay-Z retire again, there's still a possibility, even if it is a slim possibility, of this collaboration coming to fruition. So you better watch her or she mine, man. Ain't no ring on her finger like LeBron hand. So this line was in reference to the fact that in 2011 when the song released, LeBron James hadn't won any NBA championship rings up to that point, which some quick Google searching tells me that up to that point in his career, he hadn't been an active member of a team that won the NBA finals in a given year. However, this line aged poorly just the year after the song came out, as in 2012, LeBron James would win his first NBA championship ring with Miami Heat, and then in 2013, the year after, he would win his second championship ring with Miami Heat again. And if that wasn't enough, in 2016, he won his third ring with the Cleveland Cavaliers, and then in 2020, he would win his fourth and final ring to date with the Los Angeles Lakers. This lyric aged badly four times. I mean, the line did age poorly quickly after the first ring that he got, but the three others just really add to it, you know? So that is going to be it for the video today, guys. Thank you so much for watching, and I appreciate all of you who sat through the full, I think it's like one hour and 13 minutes or something like that of this video. Really appreciate you. Like I've said before, there always is the possibility that this series could come back, but it's just retired for the time being because I've sort of ran out of lyrics that I think have a super interesting story behind them at the moment, and whenever I ask people for suggestions for the series, I just usually see the same ones coming up or lyrics that I've already covered before and I'm sure there's plenty more out there it's just hard for me to think of any at the moment so I'm gonna leave it for the time being maybe come back to it in the future. But it really was a great series, there was a lot of great videos in it, Pearly Age Rap Lyrics 4 is just one of the top performing videos on my channel, and that one, when I came up with the thumbnail for it, I just, I always felt like that was gonna be a really big part of the series, and it was. I am kinda sad that it got demonetized, cause I feel like that's one that would've hit 1 million views eventually, but after it got demonetized, it just killed its growth. Uh, but still, Half a mil is pretty crazy. And yeah, I've never really done a compilation video like this before, but I just thought it would be fun and a good thing to do for this series in particular. I think it's something that if you watch one part, you're going to want to see the rest of it. So it's all together right here. Once again, I just want to say a quick thank you to Atlas VPN for sponsoring this video. Once again, the links for that are down in the description below. And uh, yeah. Really appreciate you guys watching this one. So now it's all the usual outro stuff. I guess you could click here if you want to check out Controversial Rap Lyrics, which is a sort of pearly age rap lyrics spinoff that is still going on. And much love to all my Patreon supporters and channel members over here with a special shout out to my big ballers. And those are Big Daddy Foe, Griffin Upchurch, I Am Regent, KWG13270, and Lucas1123.